I think um, about 14, 15 years ago, I pulled into a service station in Rockhampton and um, I was fueling up my vehicle and this was probably about 10 p.m. at uh, night on a Friday night and I didn't take any notice as I was fueling up the vehicle. There was a, a bunch of um, motorcycle, gu motorcycle guys all hanging out in one corner, which they did and the car guys would be hanging out in another corner and um, it just wasn't my night to be hanging out with the car guys, you know. So um, anyway, I'm fueling up the, uh, the vehicle and this bloke comes over to me from the motorcycle crew and he goes, well, what are you doing here, Glenn? Where, where's, your, where's your motorbike? And I'm like, ah, oh, because I've got a twin brother. And I said, I'm going to take a wild guess that Glenn hasn't told you that he's got a twin brother. And this guy looks shocked and he goes, you serious? You're not Glenn? I'm going, no, no, I'm not Glenn. So um, anyway, apparently uh, my brother must have been a bit of a rat bag because um, one of the other guys pipes up by that stage, there's a group of them around me, one of the other guys piped up, how's your brother doing for money? And I'm like, I don't know, all right, he's just graduated uni and started out as an engineer. And the guy goes, well, he never puts the front wheel of his motorbike down on the road. It looks like he's trying to save money on tires. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the, the point of that story is that um, there was an unexpected person in an unexpected place. And so this morning, we're going to go to a familiar location. We're going to go to the book of Esther. But we're going to meet an unexpected character or a different character, the other hero of the book, named, well, I'm going to call him Mordecai. I'm not sure how everybody else pronounces that name. So Esther chapter 6 is where we're going to read this morning. That night, sleep escaped the king, so he ordered the book of records, the chronicles, to be brought in and read to him. And there it was found recorded that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of the eunuchs who guarded the king's entrance when they had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. The king inquired, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this act? Nothing has been done for him, replied the king's attendants. Who is in the court, the king asked. Now Haman had just entered the court of the king's palace to ask the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows he had prepared for him. So the king's attendants answered him, Haman is there, standing in the court. Bring him in, ordered the king. Haman entered and the king asked him, what should be done for the man whom the king is delighted to honour? Now Haman thought to himself, whom would the king delight to honour more than me? And Haman told the king, for the man whom the king is delighted to honour, have them bring a royal robe that the king himself has worn and a horse on which the king himself has ridden, one with a royal crest on its head. Let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them array the man the king wants to honour and parade him on the horse through the city square, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man whom the king is delighted to honour. Hurry, said the king to Haman, and do just as you proposed. Take the robe and the horse to Mordecai the Jew, who is sitting at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have suggested. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and paraded him through the city square, crying out before him, This is what is done for the man whom the king is delighted to honour. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief. Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened. His advisers and his wife Zeresh said to him, Since Mordecai, before, who, before whom your downfall has begun, is Jewish, you will not prevail against him, for surely you will fall before him. While they were still speaking with Haman, the king's eunuchs arrived and rushed him into the banquet that Esther had prepared. Father, I thank you for your word. Father, would you pour out upon us your Holy Spirit? Would you open the word to us? And would you transform my words into what your people need to hear today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. So we've picked up the story at a very interesting point. Now, the story of Esther is, is a classic. It's got all of the elements of intrigue, and it's got plots of murder, and it's got 
plot twists, it's got a bit of everything. So then, well, what did we actually miss? I'm going to see if I can summarise the, uh, the book of Esther into a, a little bit shorter than reading the whole thing. So King Xerxes, and a lot of our Bibles will say Ahasuerus or some pronunciation of that particular um, spelling. Uh, so Xerxes was his name that he was known in his own country. Ahasuerus was the Hebrew language name that they gave him. So this gentleman... He was a ruler of the Mede and the Persian Empire and they ruled the whole of the known world at that time and they'd broken it up into 127 provinces from India to Egypt. So we found that the king held a feast for the rich and the famous in his kingdom and this feast lasted for 180 days or six whole months where he showed off his fabulous wealth and everything that he had achieved. And at the end of that time, he threw a seven-day drinking party for everybody who was in his palace, from the, the lowliest of servant through to the highest of princes. And it said that he didn't restrict anyone. They were allowed to drink anything that they wanted. So this guy was uh, not particularly uh, a nice character to be around, no doubt. He, uh, he loved a good drinking party. An alcohol problem? Possibly. <laughs> And on the seventh day of this feast, when everybody was, well, our Bibles generally call it merry, but probably rather drunk, the king sent out an order and summoned his queen named Vashti. She was a very, very beautiful lady, we're told in the Bible. So he summoned her. He wanted to show her off in front of all his drunken lords. And she refused. So the king became furious. And he said to his advisors around him, what am I going to do now? And the advisors told him, in other words, divorce her and do it very publicly. And they said, if you, don't, uh, if you don't make an example of Queen Vashti, there's no man in his own house who's going to be able to, uh, to lead anymore. The women are going to say, well, Queen Vashti didn't obey the king. So that's what the king did. He, he divorced his wife very publicly. And afterwards, he's like, now what am I going to do? Yeah. So his advisors came up with another plan and I'm not sure what kind of a plan it was it's a bit of a strange one in today's world their suggestion was that commissioners or, or people be sent throughout all of his kingdom throughout 127 provinces and that they bring in it doesn't say whether they asked politely or whether they just took them bring in the, the all of the most beautiful um, virgins in the land bring them into the king's palace and that they would be prepared with duty preparations and the king would then choose which of these ones pleased him to become the queen. So to me, that doesn't sound like a particularly nice idea in today's world to have you know, a bunch of men go out throughout the land, throughout, let's say throughout Australia, take the most beautiful girls off their parents and bring them into uh, one particular place so that uh, a, a king or a ruler could um, choose from one of them after he'd spent a night with each of them. So, um, you know, I won't go into any detail per se, but you can imagine for yourself that it wasn't going to be a pleasant experience for most of these young girls who'd been taken away from their families. So, at this point, we're introduced to uh, Mordecai. And I'm guessing that if he was here in Australia, we'd instantly shorten his name to Maud, because we love nicknames. But We'll call him Mordecai because that's what's written in the scripture. So he was, Mordecai was basically a fourth generation captive when the, uh, the nation of Judah had been captured by the Babylonians. Mordecai's great grandfather had been one of the first ones carried off into captivity. And so by that stage, there'd been three other generations that had been born while they were in captivity. We'd gone from the Babylonian Empire, and uh, I'm not sure exactly how many kings uh, followed Nebuchadnezzar, but uh, we're told that Belshazzar was in charge when the Medes and Persians came and took over. And so from there, there's been two or three kings until we've got this gentleman named Xerxes. And so Mordecai is um, a, a fellow who's a captive, and he has adopted Esther. Esther, we're told, was his cousin. 
Now, I'm assuming that she was probably a lot younger than him, but he had taken her on as his own daughter. So Esther was one of the ones who was taken away by the king's um, officials and brought to the palace to be prepared for beauty, beauty treatments and all of that. Now, I'm going to take a wild guess that Mordecai was not particularly happy at this, but there's probably nothing that he can do about it. So Mordecai has instructed Esther, before she's taken away from him, not to reveal that she's of the Jewish race. And this proves to be a very wise idea as we move through the story. So these young ladies, they're all given 12 months worth of beauty preparations. Now I asked Liz how long she'd had of beauty preparations before our wedding and I think she said maybe two hours and I was like, well, I don't think I missed out, but uh, these ladies had six months worth of preparation with uh, certain ointments and another six months worth of preparation with perfumes and so on. So apparently there was a ritual to get a lady to her very, very best to before she came before the king. So every single day, Mordecai was outside of the, um, the king's palace, outside of the women's quarters, to see if he could find out news of Esther. So he never gave up on her. He really loved this young lady and he wanted to see that the very best had happened for her. So when the 12 months were up, we're told that one at a time, the king would call for a, a lady and they, that the young lady would spend a night with him and then she would be pushed over into the concubines' quarters. And I suspect that um, that's where those ladies, the, all of them other than, um, than Esther who became the queen, that's probably where they lived out most of their lives. So it probably wasn't something that they were looking forward to because it's not a normal life that a young lady would aspire to. So once again, I don't think that uh, this king or this kingdom in general was in any way, shape or form a godly example of how a kingdom is run. So to cut the story short, Esther was the one who pleased the king more than any of the others. It says he loved her. And so there was a wedding feast and um, we're not told the exact time frame, but it appears that sometime during this process, Mordecai has become noticed or um, in some way or another promoted to being one of the king's officials because we're told that he is by this stage um, at the king's gate daily. Now the king's gate in those days was a place where um, legal matters were handled and where um, official business was actually done and so it would appear that Mordecai was one of the government officials. And while he's at the gate, that he overhears two of the king's other officials plotting to murder him. It says they were furious with him. So I'm not sure what he'd done to them, but they were not happy with him. So Mordecai has um, passed on the news that he's received to Esther, and Esther has told the king. Now the king has had this investigated and it's found that those two blokes were indeed intending to murder him. And so uh, they were dealt with and the matter was recorded in the king's history books. And at this point, we get a new character who enters the scene. It just tells us that Haman had gained favor with the king and the king promoted him above all of his other officials. And it would seem that uh, with that position came the, the um, almost uh, an image of being a, a mini god of some sort because it appears that everybody was expected to bow and worship as Haman walked past. So if that was the case for Haman, I'm guessing that the king was expected to be worshipped as well. And so we're told that Mordecai refused to bow down and worship as Haman walked on past. And um, when that news came to, to Haman, Haman was furious with Mordecai. And so he went home and he thought about it, he talked with his wife and he didn't decide to try and do something against Mordecai alone. He felt that that was beneath him. He decided he was gonna take out this whole entire race of people because he'd learned that they, they all had beliefs that uh, were different to the rest of the kingdom and that they worshiped one God and one God only. And so he decided he was gonna get rid of the whole lot of them as well as Mordecai. 
So the king, uh, Mordecai has hatched a plot, he's cast lots and he's come up with a day. It's 11 months from, uh, from the day, the first month of the year. Now we call ours January. And so um, they, they were gonna run this uh, plot in the 12th month of the year on the 13th day. And so he approached the king to ask permission to, uh, to wipe out this, in whole, this whole entire race of people. Now, to offer a sweetener, we're told that he offered the king 10,000 talents of silver. Now, a quick research said that that's 342 tons of silver, which in today's value here in Australia would be about $450 million. So Haman has offered the king this sweetener, bribe, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, but the king has said, keep your money. You can have those people to do with what with them whatever you like. You can wipe out that entire race. Go ahead with your plan. So the king took off his signet ring. Now, the, the signet ring was very important in those days, and anything that went out with a, a wax seal that the signet ring had stamped was official king's business. And in those, in those days, we've learned from earlier on in, uh, say, Daniel and so on, where... The uh, Medes and Persians had a law, well, their law system was that once a law had been sealed with the king's signet ring, it could not be repealed. So the king has just passed over his ring to Haman and said, write out your best set of orders, do whatever you want with those people. So the, the orders had been sent out that on that particular day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the rest of the people were to rise up and kill every single Jew that they could find. And so, of course, the news came through to Mordecai and he went about weeping. He put on sackcloth and ashes and he mourned. He wasn't just mourning for himself, he was mourning for his whole uh, race. And we're told that Esther learned that Mordecai was walking about mourning and she she didn't know what it was, so she sent out a servant to try and um, comfort him and to give him a new set of clothes. And Mordecai sent back word with the servant to tell Esther exactly what had happened. And he asked Esther to go into the king and plead, plead for the, um, for the Jewish race, to have them saved. So Esther sent back to Mordecai saying, well, I haven't been called in front of the king for 30 days so far. Not even I'm allowed to walk into the king's office and uh, without being invited. If the king's not in a good mood, he could kill me on the spot. And so Mordecai sent back word and he said, well, that is a risk, but he said, if you do not take that risk right now, in 11 months time, even though you're in the king's palace, you will be killed as well. So Esther said, Mordecai, I need you to find as many of the Jews as you can in the capital city, gather together, and fast and pray with me for three days and three nights. And she said, I'm going to be fasting and praying with my maids for those same three days and three nights. And then I will go in before the king. And if I perish, I perish. So, of course, Mordecai does exactly as the, uh, the queen has asked. He's, he's gathered all the Jews he can find. And they've fasted and prayed for three days and three nights. Now... At this point in time, we're then told that um, the king has had a sleepless night. And so the, um, the king has, uh, well, as you do, he's asked for one of his servants to come in and read from the history books, probably to see if that would send him back to sleep. Well, what was read from the history book turned out to be the part where Mordecai had um, foiled a plot to have the king killed. So um, Esther has um, organised to have a banquet uh, organised for just the king, herself, and uh, Haman, the gentleman named Haman. Well, he's not such a gentleman, but it's a fellow named Haman. And so the, um, the, the king has um, been invited, Haman's been invited, and the... Um, and, and yeah, sorry, I'm just uh, trying to find my place in the story here, because I think I might have um, messed up. So yes, uh, 
Haman's left the king's court. He's elated that he's the only one out of all the king's officials who's been invited to go to this banquet with Queen uh, Esther and the king. But as he leaves the king's court, he has to walk through the king's gate. And of course, there's Mordecai the Jew standing there while everybody else has bowed to the ground and worshipped as he walked past. So his elation has turned into, well, he's furious again. And he walks home and he tells his wife and his friends what's just happened. And their advice to him was, how about you build a gallows? Make it the world's biggest set of gallows. We're talking 25 metres high. And ask the king if you can have Mordecai hanged on those set of gallows tomorrow. <laughs> well, it just happened that that same night was when the king had had his sleepless night and he'd had the... Um, He'd had the, the book of records read to him and it had been found that Mordecai had not been honoured for what he'd done to save the king's life. So this is where we read out in our chapter 6 passage where the, um, the king is looking for somebody to honour Mordecai just as Haman has walked in and he's going to present his request to the king to say, I want to have Mordecai the Jew hanged from these gallows. Well, the king cuts him off and asks him to honour Mordecai the Jew. So Haman, of course, he can't do anything else. He's got to follow the king's orders. So he walks around with, uh, with Haman arrayed in the king's robe on the king's horse with a, a, royal, uh, a royal flag or ensign on the horse's head. And he's got to proclaim in front of Mordecai the Jew, this is what the king does for the one whom he delights to honour. So Mordecai, he, he's raced off home as soon as he's um, as soon as he's finished that task and he's just he's devastated and his wife and his friends well of course they're no help either they say to him you've begun to fall before this guy Mordecai and he's Jewish and so your fall is going to end in complete ruin well that probably wasn't what Mordecai hoped to hear oh, sorry Haman hoped to hear either so we see then that um, immediately the king's servants had come for Haman to whisk him off to this banquet. So I'm guessing he's probably had to try and put on his best happy face by that stage. And uh, he goes into the he goes into the banquet, and um, I'm just trying to yeah he's he's gone into the banquet and the. Um, the queen is, is asked by the king, what would you like? Would you present your petition? You can have anything you want up to half of my kingdom. And the only thing Esther said that day was, can we have another banquet tomorrow? Just you and Haman, come again tomorrow to the banquet that I will prepare. And so the following day, when the uh, king and Haman turn up to the banquet, Esther tells the king that somebody has plotted to kill her and to kill her entire race. And the king's like, you're kidding me, who would do such a thing? So Esther points at Haman and says, this wicked man, Haman. The king didn't know what to say, didn't know what to do. He was so furious, he got up and he walked out of the room. Well, while he was out of the room, Haman's fallen at her feet, or fallen on her, depending on which way um, you, you read which translation. The king walks back in and he goes, would Haman even assault the queen while I am in the building? And at that point, Haman is, is hooded. They said they covered his head. He was instantly going to be executed. One of the servants said, hang on, this guy's built a gallows 25 metres tall. How about we use those? So Haman was hung on the very same gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai the Jew. Now, of course, Esther, she's still pleading for the life of her people and for herself from the, uh, the king. And the king says to her, there's nothing that can be done to change the law that Haman has written out. So he said, what we can do is we can let you and Mordecai write out your own law as best as you see fit to counteract the law that has been written by Haman. So the king once again took the ring that he'd taken off Haman and he gave that ring to Mordecai. So between Mordecai and Esther, they wrote out their own decree that authorised the Jews to gather together to arm themselves and to uh, defend themselves against anybody who wanted to attack them on that 13th day of the 12th month. In the meantime, Mordecai, we're told, gains more and more power and influence in the kingdom. 
So once that uh, 13th day of the 12th month arrives, all the king's officials are too scared to do anything else other than support the Jews. And so very few people across the whole of the kingdom are game to rise up and attack the Jews. And so they were all wiped out. Anybody who chose to, um, to try and attack the Jews, was all, they were all wiped out. So an amazing salvation was brought to the Jews because of um, the proclamation of Mordecai and Esther. Now, this was a big deal because it was through the Jewish race that we get, or we got, Jesus Christ. So if the Jewish race had been completely wiped out during this period of history, then where would Christ Jesus have come from? Well, God doesn't have a plan B. He only has a plan A. So there wasn't any possibility that the Jewish race was going to be completely annihilated at that time. However, he had prepared in advance Mordecai, the Jew, and Esther to save the Jewish people, to save them, and from them and their descendants came Christ Jesus, our Saviour, so that the Jews were saved, but we were saved as a people by Christ Jesus. So I've got um, a few points that I'd like to bring out about this story of uh, Mordecai and Esther. Mordecai's family consisted of two families, his blood family and his faith family. So when Haman's decree for destruction came out, perhaps Mordecai could have reasoned something like this. The Jews over in the province of India, they've gone a little bit strange. They think the Passover wine should be non-alcoholic. I'm making this up, don't mind. Uh, it wouldn't hurt to let them go, so perhaps I won't write the decree to include the province of India. I'll leave them out of my salvation decree. But no, Mordecai didn't do any such thing. He was in public mourning for all of his faith family. Not just his blood family, but his faith family as well. It affected him for his whole family. So what about us? When we hear about um, something on the news that affects Christians from another church or another denomination, even perhaps in another country, do we feel that same pain in our hearts that Mordecai felt for his faith family? Let's just say a, a minister from another denomination falls into sin and it becomes public news. Do we say to ourselves, Oh, well, I always thought the people from that denomination were a bit funny, so, um, yep, that's the outworking of their, um, of their teaching, no doubt. Well, no, that's not, that's not the way Christ Jesus has told us to think or to behave about our, um, about our fellow brothers and sisters. In Obadiah 1 and verse 12, we're told, but you should not gloat in that day, your brother's day of misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast proudly in the day of their distress. So our attitude towards our fellow believers, even if we don't entirely agree with them, should be patterned after Paul's instructions in the New Testament. He tells us in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially those of the family of faith. We saw in the story of Mordecai and Esther how the Jews had banded together to defend each other and they were all saved. So how much more would the kingdom of God be grown and expanded if we all looked out for each other instead of dismissing and tearing each other down? The easiest place to start is to pray God's blessing over the people who worship in the other denominations and the other churches within our region. We don't actually have to pray that um, you know, God will, will bless every sp specific little part of the way they worship. We just want God to bless the people, to pour out his Holy Spirit upon the people who worship, that they would be powerful in their communities and that the, the community would be transformed as God's people as a whole show forth Christ Jesus and his love. And the next point that I wanted to bring out is that Mordecai refused to worship anyone other than Yahweh, which is God. 
And it was clearly expected that Mordecai should have bowed down and worshipped, or at least been seen to act like he was worshipping Haman as Haman walked past. But Mordecai refused. He refused to even make a show of doing it, even if he wasn't doing it in his own heart. So even though there's absolutely no mention of the name of God in the book of Esther, we can see clearly that Mordecai was a, a devout follower of God or of Yahweh in the same way that Daniel had been many years earlier. Because Daniel refused to, um, to pray to, to King Darius. He risked the lion's den. And Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they refused to worship the giant gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. These guys refused to even make a show of doing the wrong thing. Even if they weren't doing it in their heart, they refused to even perform the action. Well, in today's world, it's pretty much unheard of to be ordered to worship an actual carved idol of gold like King Nebuchadnezzar, or ordered like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego um, I afforded like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to worship an idol of gold. And it's also unheard of, pretty much, I haven't heard of it myself, for anyone to be ordered to pray to no one other than the king or, say, the prime minister or, or you know, the highest official in the land, such as Daniel was ordered not to pray to anyone other than King Darius or for Mordecai to be expected to worship Haman as he walked past. But what about our hearts? Anything that takes God's place or squeezes him out of being absolutely number one in our lives is in itself an idol. We have so many things bombarding us and demanding our attention and our time that it's easy to let God slip down the list of priorities and we don't even notice that it's happening most of the time. So just as Mordecai had to make a painfully hard choice to refuse to bow down as Haman passed by, it's also costly for us to choose to put God first, to make him number one in our lives and to give him the first and the best of our time. The reward that we get when we do that, and we put God first, is that there's a joy that God gives us as we grow in relationship with him and with Jesus and that joy infinitely surpasses any other joy that the world and its stuff can offer us. The next point I want to make is that Mordecai is faithful. He's faithful to an ungodly king in a foreign land. Now, without going into too many details, I have attempted to point out that this guy was not a particularly nice guy, and he definitely did not follow the laws and the statutes of God Almighty. So Mordecai was in submission to the king, but he wasn't in blind obedience to the king. We see that there is a difference. So even when Mordecai was not obeying the king or not obeying the, um, the expectation to bow down and worship Haman as he walked past, he still did it in a submitted way. He didn't, he didn't slag off at Haman. He simply just politely refused and said, I cannot do that because I am a Jew. Or, in other words, I worship the one true only God. He did so, disobeyed in submission. And we see even that Mordecai has warned uh, the king, he has warned the king of a plot to take his life. Even though the king was uh, not a nice guy, we see that Mordecai has actually been faithful to the man whom he knows that God has appointed as his leader, as his ruler, and he's warned him that there's a plot against his life. I'm not sure whether I knock around in circles or at a bit rough sometimes, but um, sometimes I've heard people say something like, I wish somebody would just go and knock off the Prime Minister or knock off you know, somebody. When there's a law being proposed or when it looks like something's, um, you know, ungodly or unpleasant even as the um, circumstances may be. That is not God's way. God's way is for us to be faithful and God rewards faithfulness. 
Jesus tells us in Luke 16, verse 10, whoever is faithful with very little will also be faithful with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. We saw in the story of Mordecai how he was raised up. God raised him up a bit at a time as he was faithful in the kingdom in which he served. And he became one of the highest officials in the kingdom, along with Esther, which enabled them to save the entire Jewish race at that time. And in Jeremiah 20, 29 verse 7, we're told, or the, the Jews were told at the time, seek the prosperity of the city to which I have sent you as exiles. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for if it, if, for if it prospers, you too will prosper. So if God had told the Jews to seek the prosperity of the city where they were being um, held as captives, then how much more shall we be able to seek the prosperity of the towns and cities in which we dwell, to ask God to prosper the souls, to prosper the minds, to prosper the health and to prosper the, the wealth of the town and the city in which we live. We start with prosperity of soul and we work our way to prosperity in every other way. We have the, um, we have the example of God telling us or telling the Jews to pray for the cities in which they be, were being held exiled. So as free men and women, surely God wants to bless our towns and cities as well. Which includes praying for the politicians and the leaders whom he has appointed as, uh, as leaders over us. It's not always the first thing that comes to my mind. It is something I actually have to convince myself to do, is to pray for them and ask God's blessing over them, ask God's wisdom for them, as opposed to slagging off at them like I always used to do. So God <coughs> wants you and I to be faithful, and he has rewards waiting for us as well. So in conclusion, if we are people who can begin to grasp the concept of the Church of Jesus Christ as one body, as one family, if we're people who seek to defend the greater body of Christ and seek God's favour and blessing on the whole of the body and not just our own little fellowship, if we're people who will make deliberate choices to worship God only in every part of our lives and carve out that time to spend with him, if we're people who are faithful in little as well as in much, both to God and those whom he has put in authority over us, then the power of the risen Christ Jesus and by the, uh, by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit will work powerfully in building up and increasing the kingdom of God in our towns and in our regions, in Blackall and the surrounding regions. I believe that will happen in ways that we can't even begin to imagine yet as we, make, as we learn to love our fellow brothers and sisters in this room and in the other congregations as wherever people meet across this region, if we display the love that Christ Jesus has commanded us to have, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, by this, shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. And that's a choice. It's something we have to deliberately choose to do when we hear bad news about another congregation. Play, pray God's blessing and God's healing, not criticise them and, oh yeah, well, they kind of deserve that because they've got things a bit wrong, you know, all those kind of things. God's family needs to be our family, just as our own blood families, we, we, we are concerned with them and we want the best for them. So we need to have concern and want the best for our family of faith as well. Father, I thank you that you know us and you love us. Jesus, I thank you that you died for one flock. You died for one people. Would you grant us the ability to see ourselves as being one with all the brothers and sisters across this region? And Lord, would you fill our hearts with your love for your people? And Lord, this week, as we go about our business, Lord, would you give us kingdom opportunities to share the love of Christ with those around us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.